Greetings. And if you're listening around the time that this is being recorded, Chag Sameach, Happy Festival of Pentecost to you. Also known, of course, as the Festival of First Fruits and the uh, Festival of Weeks. Pentecost, the Festival of the 50th Day. I'm grateful for your interest in this ministry and I want to to, to uh, tell you, to alert you to uh, my son's organization of a of a format of a of an of a Pentecost service that you might want to connect with on the Flair Church. There is a Pentecost service available uh, for your spiritual edification uh, on YouTube on uh, the Flair uh, Church channel. And this, of course, is going to be is we have, of course, our uh, Christian Commandment Keepers channel that many of you are going to be watching this message on. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties on the Sabbath before Pentecost. This is the year 2020, and this year Pentecost comes out on May 31st on the modern calendar. And, la and so yesterday was the Sabbath, and it was May 30th on the modern calendar. And uh, we had some technical difficulties, so the message got out there a bit later than we normally do it. Uh, but uh, I, we hope that uh, over time it'll, it'll be uh, viewed and, and will be helpful. And it had to do with the meaning of this festival. And today I want to go further into the meaning of this festival. And as you know, I don't have long talks that I, <clears throat> that I uh, broadcast. I, I had a, a, a friend uh, I had great uh, uh, respect for and admiration for. Uh, and uh, he was an evangelist who was known for speaking uh, at great length. I remember one time he, he said, he came one evening and, and he said, well, you know, around 10 o'clock we'll serve coffee and donuts, you know, and uh, he, as he, it didn't really get, he didn't really go that late, I don't think, but he joked around. One time he told people, I've got three points, but there's two, two hours per point. And so anyway, I was thinking about him as, as I happen, happened to read something that, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase, that when you come to church, a long, there's a fine line between a long drawn out sermon and a hostage situation. I got a kick out of that. So this is going to be a brief talk, but there's a lot of information implied in it. And this is because I've spoken on this subject often and never quite... <laughs> Never quite got it I, I, the way I, I, I have it now. So I'm calling this talk More Understanding. And of course, you don't know about what. It kind of reminds me of a, a booklet that another evangelist wrote uh, who has been kind of a father figure for me. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote a booklet called uh, Can You Explain It? <laughs> and so you have to you have to kind of uh, read the booklet to figure out what it is, you know, you know what you can explain. And at the time, I, I said, well, I'm going to write a sequel to this booklet. One, one word title. No. But anyway, Can You Explain It was a good booklet. It's probably available online. Uh, nowadays, everything's available out there. It had to do with v uh, differing views about the nature of the millennium. Anyway, I call this talk More Understanding, and that's because I've given several talks over the years on the divine covenants. You know, Brit in Hebrew, the Athiki the Athe the Athe in the Greek, divine covenants, and I believe now that I've come to an understanding to organize them in terms of God's number of completeness, seven, and then superabundance, going above and beyond, and that is eight. And that's kind of like what happens in this particular week. We have the regular six days, the seventh day Sabbath, and then we have another holy day after the Sabbath, going above and beyond. You know, it's a power-packed time. Uh, and uh, I think it ties in with the covenants. The festival of Pentecost is a festival of covenants. In Hebrew, uh, the word for uh, weeks and the word for covenants are, is almost the same, or the word for oaths, I should say, the word for oaths, and uh, O-A-T-H-S. And so in a way, oaths are like covenants. So the festival of Pentecost is, is like a festival of covenants, and this is brought out in a book called the Book of Jubilees, which is an intertestamental book. And I made a mistake yesterday of saying it's quoted in, in, uh, in the Bible. I meant to, uh, actually, it's the Book of Enoch, another intertestamental book, is quoted in Jude. So uh, I hope that wasn't a problem to anybody. Uh, so Jubilees is out there, and it's interesting. 
but it's not, of course, in the canon, and neither is the Book of Enoch. But as I said, it does seem the Book of Enoch is quoted in, in Jude, but that doesn't make the book, all of the book, valid. I mean, Paul quoted a, uh, in the book of, in his letter to the Corinthian church, he quotes a, a famous Greek, uh, what do we call it, I guess a Greek proverb, and that doesn't mean that all the writings of that particular, if whoever wrote that, that all of his writings now become scripture, that particular one was quoted. He does that more than once. He quotes uh, Greek poets and and so forth, you know, that, so, you know, what the Bible quotes is canonical, what it leaves out is not canonical. I am now reading from the canon. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 16, 8, and here Paul tells uh, the church at Corinth that I referred to a moment ago, he says, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. It would seem, you know, that the Pentecost was some, some day that uh, was a day that the church observed. And it's interesting that although, unfortunately, mainstream Christianity uh, has, um, for the time being, rejected keeping the, whole, the appointed times of the Bible as substituting their own package, uh, nevertheless, many do observe Pentecost. Uh, for example, I happened to be watching uh, news and I saw the niece of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and uh, she, she was mentioning the fact of Pentecost. Uh, that many churches were, will be keeping Pentecost. Either she, it was either something she said yesterday or today, but referring to Pentecost, and uh, so many, there are many mainstream churches even that do have, uh, acknowledge uh, Pentecost, but it is one of the appointed times uh, that are called God's appointed times in Leviticus 23. And I want to talk about the various covenants that you find in the Bible, divine covenants. And I may turn to scriptures now and then to clarify. A lot of them I'm going to refer to, so it'll give you a lot of room to study. And as I said, I've spoken on this subject over the years, and I won't comment on one sermon I gave on this subject. Well, I'm going to comment, but not at length, in, at length because it would really lead us into, ha, into the weeds. I gave a sermon on this subject in 1988 that I think had a revolutionary impact, but I'll leave that for another day. Uh, I want to uh, go to Hosea 6 and verse 7. Hosea 6 and verse 7. And uh, the, uh, fortunately, if you have a, a you know, halfway decent translation, you'll have some marginal notes. That'll be helpful. The first covenant that that uh, that was made with human beings was made with Adam, with Adam, uh, and uh, with Adam and Eve. You could call it the Edenic covenant uh, or the Adamic covenant. Uh, and uh, in verse Hosea six seven, it says, "But like men, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt treacherously with me." Speaking of Israel, but. Uh, Look at the marginal note. Like Adam, Adam, like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. So Adam had a covenant with God that he transgressed. And the covenant involved, it seems to me, if you look at the Garden of Eden, life in, in, in an Edenic kind of environment where nature is our ally, where animals are at peace with us, where we're safe. Uh, now, if you look at the prophecies of the millennium, that kind of environment is restored. Uh, so as part of God's new covenant, uh, he does restore that, uh, ap that, that aspect of life. And you can find it in uh, Ezekiel. I'm, I may not read a lot of verses, but I, uh, but I believe you'll find it in Ezekiel um, 34. Um, um, Actually, I see it's in Ezekiel uh, 35. Um, okay, so Ezekiel 35, you find... Um, no, it is 34. I'm right. Good. Ezekiel 34, I was right. It reminds me of the person who, who said, I'm always right, except one time. And that's when I thought I was wrong, but it turned out I was right. Well, anyway, no, Ezekiel 34 
uh, is where you find find uh, references, and also Hosea 2. Uh, if you go to Hosea 2 and Ezekiel 34, uh, you'll see uh, references to how different nature will be in the millennium. And then, of course, you have the classical verse in Isaiah 11 that everybody knows about. So, in any case, we do have that covenant with Adam that's restored under the under the new covenant. So, I'll, I'll, it's the Adamic covenant or the Edenic covenant. Then, of course, we have the Noahide covenant or Noah, 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 Noahic. Some call it the Noahic covenant. And that covenant you find in, in, uh, in Genesis uh, 8 and 9 where uh, nature is going to be normal. Uh, there, there is a brief, very brief interruption in that as the world is prepared for the next level, you know, as it's, as it's prepared for new heavens and new earth. As God directly intervenes in human history, history comes to its climax. We go into the millennium and then into the uh, white throne period and the new heaven and new earth. So to prepare for all of that, there's a brief period where there's a disruption. But basically from now till then, uh, history, uh, life goes as normal, day and night, the various seasons. And along with that, no deluge, the, uh, no more worldwide a deluge, uh, as as many you know, as as the, there was an e Negro spiritual, as we used to call them, uh, called the I believe it was called the fire next time, or it was it was a phrase in 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 the in in that hymn, the fire next time, and then a a a, 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 a famous novelist in the 1960s, I believe, wrote a novel with that title or an essay. So in any case, eventually fire, the world is burned up, and we have a new heaven and new earth, but the water, no. The, day, the worldwide flood, no. So we have the, the Noahide covenant, and there's a sign connected with it, not on our part, but on God's part. The, the, he, he has designated the rainbow to remind us of that. Not that there were never, I don't believe that it means there was never a rainbow before, but he designated the rainbow to be a sign of that, of that covenant. Then we have, very critically, what I call the Israelite covenant. And that's where I'm making a bit of an, an adjustment here. I'm, I'm trying to think, what should I call this covenant? It does begin with Abraham in Genesis 17. And uh, it does include uh, in it uh, the, the uh, sign of, of circumcision, the act of circumcision, which is also commanded of the Israelites uh, in, uh, uh, from when they gather at Mount Sinai and in, the, and in the wilderness. It's commanded of them in the 12th chapter of Leviticus. So we have the, the covenant that's made with Abraham and uh, the, and the um, uh, circumcision is the sign of that covenant. And it involves, uh, it goes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. And then we have the, the 12 tribes that come from Jacob or the, the people of Israel. And the Israelites were designated as the nation that would be in effect, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll read it in Exodus 19. Uh, they were to be, as it says in Exodus 19, as I said, I am going to turn to some scriptures for clarification. Uh, otherwise, you'd be, you, you, know, you wouldn't want to see this talk because it would be too long. You'd think, oh, no, I don't want to commit that much time. Anyway, in Exodus 19 and verse uh, 3, I'll start in the fourth verse. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me, Mamlechet Kohanim Vegoi Kadosh, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And then if you go to Deuteronomy 4, the role that they were supposed to play, and so I believe the covenant with Abraham becomes further clarified as his descendants, the children of Israel, come to Mount Sinai and ratify the covenant. And this day, I believe, is the anniversary of that. Pentecost is the anniversary of the ratification of the Old Covenant, we, uh, as, as we often call it. We have uh, the Book of the Law, Exodus 20 through 23, and then we have the ratification in, in Exodus 24. And in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 4, Verse 5, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Eternal my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples 
who will hear of these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the eternal our God is to us for whatever reason uh, we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? So Israel was to have a specific land, it was to be a, a, a which, which is in a very strategic position if you're trying to influence the world. And they were to be a, a, a model and an example. And of course, they, they failed in, in, in that. But that was, that was what I would call the Israelite covenant. But it remains, it remains valid. And, uh, and, uh, and I'll say, in, in, as time goes on, I'll clarify that remark. But as part of that covenant, then God made specific promises, uh, uh, which are covenants, to specific branches of that nation, and those remain in effect. Uh, he, he, for example, uh, uh, in Malachi uh, 2, he had a covenant, well, uh, well, I already talked about the covenant at Sinai, as I said, which is a continuation of that covenant with Abraham. It involves the land of Israel, the people of Israel, and their role historically. And then to go on, then we have a covenant with Levi and Malachi, mentioned in Malachi 2, uh, and their role, uh, uh, just as Israel is to be a priest for the world, within Israel there are priests to Israel. And so we have the, Le the, the Levites. Then we have a covenant in November, Numbers 18 with Aaron. So the one branch of the Levites particularly were priests, and Levites would assist them. So we have the Aaronic covenant in Numbers 18. It gets more specific in Numbers 25, where Phineas, a, a grandson of Aaron, is promised that his priesthood would be eternal. And so you find in Ezekiel 44 that in the millennium, not all of the descendants of Aaron are going to be priests just those of Zadok, descendants of Zadok, who is a descendant of Phineas. <laughs> so that covenant continues all the way through from Numbers 25 in, uh, through the millennium. So we have that covenant. Um, so we could have the Levitical covenant, the Aaronic covenant, and the, uh, the Phinehasic, Phinehasic covenant. Okay, Then we have the Davidic covenant. We have a, uh, in 2 Samuel 23, you can see it, there's a, a covenant with David. His a descendant will be the king of kings. His descendant will be the Messiah. The Mashiach, Christos, the Messiah, the Christ, will, must be, humanly speaking, of David. So, all, And all of these covenants remain valid all through history. Uh, the Levi, uh, uh, And as I said, the covenant with Israel had to be, uh, had to be modified because Israel uh, failed. And so in Jeremiah 31, 31, we have an additional promise uh, or, an adi or a new covenant is promised. Now that new covenant is made with Israel and Judah. And so it means that even though they failed under the new covenant, they will still have the opportunity to be uh, the nation which will be the model nation in, in the world to come, the world the world tomorrow, the aw the wonderful world tomorrow, the awesome age ahead, the messianic era. Israel will be, uh, the capital of the world will be in Jerusalem, and Israel will be a model nation then. Uh, this time they'll be, they'll, they'll do the job they, that needs to be done. And so, but it'll be under the conditions of the new covenant. However, the new covenant has an addition, uh, additional factor to it in that the new covenant includes all nations of the world so that Israel still has a special role to play as they were committed to do. But now uncircumcised uh, Gentiles can be as much, you know, a part of God's family as Israelites. No distinction. You know, so on the physical level in the world, Israel is, is, is a model nation. But in terms of spiritually speaking, in terms of salvation, you know, it's, it's a le level playing field, circumcised or uncircumcised. The new covenant includes everyone. It also provides for not only having an understanding of God's will and the capacity to really do it, but it also involves forgiveness of, of sin. And so that's another factor uh, in, the, in the new covenant. So what we have is in effect seven covenants and then that eighth, you know, the new covenant. You know, we have the covenant with Adam, the covenant with Noah, 
we have the the covenant of Israel, and then as part of that, we had uh, Levi, Aaron, Phineas, and David, uh, and that gave us seven. And then we have the eighth, you know, the new covenant, and uh, that, and and so all the others are really included in that one. It's really beautiful, and uh, this is my understanding of it. Now, if you want to contribute input, you, you know, that's fine. Now, I want to say there's more to the story. Uh, there are four signs uh, that go with 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 these co with with the covenants, uh, with, with the uh, covenant, uh, the Israelite covenant. There are four signs involved, and uh, it, it, you could say that eventually that covenant will include not only Israel but the whole world, and so and and four is the number of the whole world. You know, there if you look at the Bible, how number four is used, it's used to indicate the whole world. You know, north, south, east, and west. Uh, you have four kingdoms that rule the world before Jesus Christ returned because the fourth one is resurrected seven times or, or, or eight, depending uh, how you want to reckon it. Okay, are you still with me? So there are four signs. One of them is circumcision, as I've said. There's a, spe a specific command for the children of Israel to circumcise and, and, and uh, you know, if at all possible, on the eighth day. So that that, that is something... That is obvious to other <laughs> other people. You know, the, uh, the fact that uh, Jews are circumcised and particularly on the eighth day, that is certainly a, an outward sign of the covenant. Uh, and um, there are two others. And uh, by the way, circumcision is also a ticket into the sacrificial system. Uh, in other words, if, if, if a woman, her husband, uh, you know, an Israelite woman would need to have a, a circumcised husband, a circumcised father, a circumcised elder brother, or perhaps as a widow, uh, a circumcised son taking care of her. You know, she would be associated with it was a circumcised male, and that circumcised male, because of, of being circumcised, would have access, full access, to the sacrificial system, which was a part of the of the covenant of Sinai. But that isn't necessary under the new covenant. Sacrifices have been taken care of. We do have a ritual similar to a sacrifice, but it's it's a uh, it's the unleavened bread and wine uh, at the Lord's Supper at the New Testament Passover. But we don't no animal sacrifices are required of a of a Christian, so uh, we don't have that that problem to to deal with. So one can be saved uncircumcised. Uh, all right. So that okay. So um, then we have uh, another sign. Uh, as I said, there, there, there are two signs that involve the sacrificial system. In Leviticus 2, we see salt offered with the, with the offerings. So that means that in a world where most religions had sacrificial systems, Israel's was, was uh, specific or, or, or unique in that salt was required w with the offerings. So that's something that people would know about in that world where, where sacrificial uh, rituals were, were something that mo most religions had. The Israelite religion in their sacrifices had salt that needed to be offered. And you could see symbolism in the salt. You know, we're the salt to the earth. Uh, the salt is a preservative. Salt also adds, adds flavor. So it's symbolic of, of the church. But salt particularly indicates permanence. So it indicates the permanence of the of the uh, covenant, and then another symbol which you, which you find in Leviticus 24 is the showbread, the 12 loaves that were baked in, in honor of the 12 tribes of Israel that were food for the priests, and again, that would be something that people would note uh, because it's out there as part of the sacrificial rituals, and so it would be noticed, it's an outward sign, uh, and it, 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 it is part, it is associated with the sacro, sacrificial system, but it is a specific sign of the, of the covenant. It's designated that way. Now, now, and now there's the one very critically important one I'm going to get to, and that is the weekly Sabbath. Now, that is a specific command. It's part of the Decalogue. It's part of the Ten Commandments. The weekly Sabbath uh, is, is, is critically important, but it's also a sign in Exodus 31 of the covenant. And indeed... It has been, you know, the, uh, along, uh, along with circumcision, the fact that the, 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 the people of Israel are associated with the Sabbath kept the identity of, of those who, who continued to do it. What I mean by that is the Jews who kept the Sabbath, who have kept the Sabbath all these centuries, they're identified as Israel. The other tribes are lost. They're called the lost 10 tribes. But, but uh, we, we know the Jews are Israel, 
uh, and they, uh, they, they're a remnant of, of the old nation. They're the southern kingdom, but they kept the Sabbath, so they, they are still known, uh, identified as, as who they are. Uh, so the, the Sabbath is, is a critical sign of, of the covenant, and it remains because it's it's not really a source. It's not directly dependent upon upon sacrifices. Neither is circumcision, for that matter. It's not dependent upon them. Uh, you need it in order to participate in them fully, but it's not dependent on them. So, anyway, we have those signs of the covenant. And now you can see why in Matthew 12, uh, Jesus made an analogy between the showbread and the Sabbath, because both of them were were signs of the covenant. Uh, and, and so he made a comparison there in Matthew 12 between the showbread and the Sabbath, if you want to go back over that. Okay, so are we, are we all here? So we have these seven covenants, and we have the signs of the covenants. And now we go to the eighth. And the eighth was important because, uh, as I said, because of the, the, the world as we know it, the, the post-Garden of Eden world uh, is a world with sin. And uh, because of that, you have seven days of unleavened bread preceded by an eighth day, a day which is not a holy day, but it's a day when the Passover was sacrificed. And nowadays, it's the day on which we have the uh, New Testament Passover, the Lord's Supper. That, that becomes necessary because of sin. Then you have the seven days of the Festival of Tabernacles and tacked on, you have another holy day, a distinct holy day, the eighth day of sacred assembly, which is also necessary because uh, of the fact that many, most people will have lived and died and uh, without understanding, without, ha without being forced to make that decision. Uh, you know, they've, they've sinned, they've sinned and, and they've fallen short, but they never have had to confront, you know, clearly the decision. And of whether they're going to commit their, themselves to God or not. So during that eight, that extra period, that white, that white throne judgment period, those who've lived and died and not made that commitment, one way or the other, will have the opportunity to do so. So it's there again because of the nature of the world. Uh, in effect, God started out from the beginning, evidently, with a plan B, uh, which which He implemented. Uh, anyway, so uh, we have now this eighth covenant which is the new covenant. And it, it, it's needed because we need to get back into a right relationship with God that Adam and Eve lost when they deliberately, in a very very critically significant way, rebelled. And uh, therefore they were exiled from Eden. And so in effect, human beings from, from that point on have been living in effect in a state of spiritual exile. Uh, and so that relationship is restored when we repent when we come under the sacrifice of jesus christ and then we receive god's spirit so now we have a a relationship with god that allows us to understand his will and allows us to implement his will in our lives and that's as i explained in a sermon i just recently gave uh, just so a few hours yesterday and some of you just recently heard it. Maybe, maybe, maybe you will have heard it just a few hours before this one. I talked about the the uh, Holy Spirit as a down payment on being resurrected from physical to spirit. So let's go to Hebrews the eighth chapter, and I'm going there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I'm going there, brothers and sisters. You know, whatever applies. I, I'm going there because it explains Jeremiah 31. Uh, Jeremiah, it, it quotes it, but then it, it elaborates just a bit. So you can look at Jeremiah 31, and then you'll go here to Hebrews 8. Jeremiah 31, 31, and then through around verse 34 there. But Hebrews 8 uh, uh, goes into it with some explanation. So here I go, Hebrews 8, 8. Uh, let's go to verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. And because of, of, of <coughs> time restraints, I won't even quote the verse. I'll just say God says he's going to make a new covenant with Israel and Judah. But we understand from the New Testament that it begins there, but it, but, but it goes to the whole world. And it, it, uh, circumcision is not needed. 
be, because it's now in, now inclusive of all human beings, and God revealed that in the New Testament. But notice that why did he do this? Verse 8. Uh, let's go to 7 in the beginning of verse 8. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would be found even sought for a second, because finding fault with them. You know, so it's not that the covenant was at fault. We were at fault. And uh, so God has to deal with us in, in such a way that, that we can have a, a right relationship with him and fulfill our potential. So we need, to, we need to have our spirit united with his. We need to have the Holy Spirit come into, into, into us uh, in that sense. You know, I, obviously there's no exact words for what happens to spiritual process where, where we have a certain connection with the mind of God and you know with the power of God to to understand and to and to do his will so we receive God's spirit and that is the new covenant and and nationally it will begin with 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 the Israelites uh, as once the uh, nation is fully restored in in the Middle East in the millennium then the influence will go out but also in the meantime uh, because the, the uh, remnant of Israel, the nation of Judah, uh, basically as a, as a nation rejected the new covenant when it was offered the leadership. Many did accept it, and of course it did begin in Jerusalem, etc. But after a time, it became basically a Gentile matter, you know, and uh, people came from, from uh, all around. Uh, and uh, I believe many descendants of the lost tribes became a part of it. That's the subject for another day. But the southern kingdom, at first, many were part of it, but most were not. And the leadership eventually made a firm commitment against it. And so that has to be dealt with, and that will be dealt with. Eventually, the southern kingdom will be restored, you know, will be, will be reconciled to Jesus Christ, who is Jewish and, and always will be. And, and, and then uh, also the northern and southern kingdoms will be reunited and be there in the middle of uh, in the middle east as we call it where europe asia and africa come together they will influence the rest of the world but for these per for this period of time between uh the time of the resurrection of jesus christ and the time of his return uh you know right now it's a wide open situation and it's not a, not ethnically based um and in the future it, it will begin with one ethnic group and then extend out to everybody so are, are we okay with that? I want to go now to Exodus 24, and this day of Pentecost does picture the ratification of the of the co Israelite covenant, and then the ratification of the new covenant, which creates in effect a new Israel. It doesn't displace the the nation of Israel and what it and its role, but it opens up the new covenant salvation to everybody. So now there is a new Israel, and uh, there is the Israel of God, those who are converted. And there's also spiritual Jews, uh, as Romans uh, talks about. So Galatians 6 speaks of the Israel of God. Romans 2 speaks of being a Jew spiritually. And that's far more important than your ethnicity. I don't care what your ethnicity is. You know, spiritually speaking, you must become converted, and then you become, spiritually speaking, Israel. You become, uh, as Galatians says, you become uh, uh, spiritually descendants of Abraham, spiritually speaking, and heirs according to the promise. But I do want to go to uh, Exodus 24, and here you have the ratification of the Old Covenant. And it's interesting, it's done with blood, it's done with sacrifices, but then there's a special, uh, special passage which you could really take time with, but I'll just briefly refer to. In, in verse 8 of Exodus 24, And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Eternal has made with you, according to all these words. Then Moses went up also, went up also Aaron. So now the priests are going with Moses. Moses was a Levite, but his elder brother was the high priest, and his sons come up here. Then Moses went up also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. So that's, that's important. So we have a representation of the nation. Then they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the, um, the very heavens in its clarity. 
But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God and they ate and drank. So actually, God manifested himself in such a way that they actually had a, a formal meal uh, uh, as part of the, uh, except ratification of the covenant, there was a formal meal, which, which was the custom in the Middle East to have, when you had a formal pact like that, there'd be a formal meal involved. And so there is. And of course, what this reflects is the ultimately, when we come to the New Testament, we find when Jesus Christ returns, we have Revelation 19. And I'm going to go there. When Jesus Christ returns, um, verse 7 of Revelation 19, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So the old covenant, as far as it, which involved uh, punishments and penalties and, and uh, disciplinary measures, that is not going to be reinstituted. That eventually vanishes, as Hebrews says, and is superseded by the new covenant. But the new covenant... In, is not just for one nation, it's for the whole world. And when Jesus Christ returns, he returns to first uh, meet his resurrected saints that come from all the nations of the world. And then from there, you know, during the millennium, I believe most people will, will, will then co come in as part of the family of God. And I believe, again, during the white throne judgment period, nearly everybody there will want to become a part of of God's family. So ultimately, you know, we'll have uh, billions of brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. You know, God is infinite. And God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnibeneficent, and eternal. And uh, he has his plan where he will have billions of sons and daughters. So anyway, in Revelation 19, 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And... Um, There, um, on verse nine, I want to read. Then he said to me, "To me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb." And he said to me, "These are the true sayings of God." So it seems that this uh, marriage supper will not be just a small representation, but everybody can, <laughs> who everybody who is who who is a part of that of the first fruits. This, this day pictures the first fruits of the wheat harvest being offered as symbolic of the church as first fruits of converted humanity. Later on, uh, when the harvest is completed, the autumn festival pictures the conversion of the rest of humanity. But those who are first fruits, I believe everyone will have the opportunity to participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it says here, you know, blessed, uh, blessed are those who do. So I want to summarize, because I've said a lot in a short time, and I hope that this will stimulate interest in you in studying into many of these things. And, and as I said, if you feel that somehow um, I have yet to really fully <laughs> dominate this subject, let me know. I've been struggling with this since 1988. Uh, so from my understanding is that we have a covenant with Adam, a covenant with Noah, and then we have a covenant with Israel, and then as part of that, we had a covenant with, with, with uh, Levi, Aaron, Phineas, and David. And then I believe, in, you know, all of them then uh, are, are one, or, one way or the other are included in the awesome eighth covenant, which is the new covenant, the Brit Chadashah that's promised in Jeremiah 31. Uh, uh, I believe in the Greek, the new covenant. And, and it is the new covenant that comes, of course, in Acts 2. And... Um, let me just go there to finish. Uh, I was going to finish in Revelation 19, but since this is Pentecost, let's finish with Acts 2. And uh, notice that uh, this very day of Pentecost, uh, back in A.D. 31, 1989 years ago, the church was together, uh, uh, verse, uh, Acts 2, 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord, what with one accord in one place, and then seven great miracles occurred, right? The rushing wind, the tongues of fire, uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking other languages, being understood in other languages, Peter's inspired sermon, conversion of 25 times the original 120, 3,000 in one day, 
And so the jump start, right? The church is off, off and running, and the church uh, is eternal, and it is the uh, mother of us all. At, uh, in in one analogy, in another analogy, of course, um, it is the uh, it is the uh, bride of uh, of uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, in another analogy, we become brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ when we come up. We become a part of God's church. In other words, in various ways, it, God uses family to instruct us about our relationship with him. It is a familial relationship. You know, we, we enter into God's family as we become a part of, of God's church. As we're converted, we then become a part of God's family. And as we become a part of God's family, we then share in God's Holy Spirit and we take on more and more the personality and character of Jesus Christ. May that be said of each and every one of us at this special time of the year. Have a wonderful Pentecost if you're keeping it when you hear this message. But whenever you hear this message, I hope and pray it will benefit you spiritually. All the best to you and yours.